Okay, let's get started. Uh, hello and welcome to the panel, Dancing About Architecture, Depicting Other Arts Through Comics. My name is Craig Fisher, and it's my pleasure to moderate this panel featuring the following abundantly talented comics artists. Uh, Karen Katz is a dancer, cartoonist, and school visual arts graduate who has published two graphic novels, The Academic Hour and The Backstage of a Dishwashing Web Show from 2019. These books and her short pieces and anthologies and series published by Fantagraphics, Retrofit, Kuss, and many others earned Karen a deserved nomination for the SPX Ignatz Award for Outstanding Artist. She is part of Nat Micro Press, a nonprofit publisher of experimental poetry and comics, and the Tel Aviv based Humdrum Comics Collective. And I'm asking all of them after I do these little introductions to tell you where they are on the floor so we won't forget to do that at the end of the panel. So, B3. <laughs> Bingo. And also uh, Secret Acres. There you go. Thank you. Reinhold Kleist is the Berlin-based writer, artist of many graphic novels, including the music biographies Johnny Cash, I See a Darkness, Nick Cave, Mercy on Me, and 2023's English translation of Starman, Bowie's Stardust Years. His other books include Castro from 2015, An Olympic Dream, The Story of Samia Youssef Omar from 2016, and two books that explore the intersection of boxing and history, The Boxer, The True Story of Holocaust Survivor Harry Half, and Knockout, The True Story of Emil Griffith from 2021. Where are you located, Reinhardt? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, you're at the Self-Made Hero. Yeah, table, it's right? Self-Made Hero is something with, something by K. Okay, but I don't so know the K, number. I K know you're on something. NCAP too, yeah. so not too hard to find. And then Leslie Stein is the cartoonist of the LA Times Book Pride award-winning present from 2017, as well as I Know You Writer, Bright Eyed at Midnight, and the Eye of the Majestic Creature series. Her diary comics have been featured in the New Yorker, Vice, and in the Best American Comics Anthology. Her newest book is 2023's Brooklyn's Last Secret, a hilarious ensemble comedy about a touring rock band named Major Threat that pavement bassist Mark Eibold called, quote, the most realistic band on tour story that I've read. Uh, where are you, Leslie? Um, I think I'm at table W86, the special guest table. I'll be there for one hour tomorrow if you want to stop by. Cool. Thank you. And then Andrew White is perhaps best known for Yearly, a comic he's been publishing annually since 2018, although the digital archive of the comics on his website, all of which you should read, includes work that goes back to 2011. Just released this month by Field House Press, Field Mouse Press, not Field House Press, is the book Together and Apart, biographies of Virginia Woolf, Gertrude Stein, and Georgia O'Keeffe, where Andrew takes various poetic approaches to these three female creators and other people in their lives, like Alice B. Toklas and Alfred Stiglitz. So let me begin with the question. Since the first word in our panel title is dancing, let me begin with a question for Karen. Um, and I'm sorry, I, of course, the, I oh. always forget to advance all the slides while I'm introducing people. <laughs> um, uh, what affinities do you see between your performances as a dancer and puppeteer and the way you draw bodies on the page? Um, well, it's a, it's a circle which I am just now completing. Um, I danced from age four to 18 and I had to stop and that's when I started art therapy and then uh, took a hiatus from the trajectory of my life which was becoming a top surgeon in some really great hospital, and, and went to art school for my soul, and uh, fell in love. Um, but I couldn't never get over the loss of dance as my medium, which I identified with, which um, more than words, I, I trusted dance to be my um, mask as I go through the world, and I lost that. And um, I... I lost I, I, I lost all sense of my myself in the world. Uh, so uh, comics just became my other proxy, a body that existed outside of mine. Um, uh, but I uh, was always pretending, I mean, you can say this retroactively, uh, pretending that I was writing narratives when what I was really doing was uh, creating choreographies hmm. and then um, uh, filming myself dancing, which I would never do in public because of the loss of my skill, um, and then dancing and seeing how people react to that without the consequence of uh, them seeing 
is kind of like the Dory. That's what I saw myself with. Um, and so the character, and I use no frames. So the dancing, even though the comics itself are not about dancing, they're just about everyday stuff, but uh, all the characters are dancing nonetheless. Um, and I use them as arrows pointing to the next place in the story. And only now, as I approach my 40th year on Earth, um, <laughs> am I starting to trust myself again um, that I have uh, I need uh, I have a need why not feed it <laughs> um, and so now I'm doing it consciously of thinking how dance and uh, my comics connect not doing it like secretly is um, I have one purpose but I'm working in the medium of comics and people think I'm doing a story and they don't quite understand what I'm doing and I I uh, feel like a failure at storytelling. Um, I'm using, um, I'm saying that this is a language for me to practice movement uh, in a different space. Was that the question? Yeah, I, I think that's really interesting because it follows up in the next question that I have, which is your book sometimes makes really direct and kind of ominous connections between the human body and the environments that they occupy. Mm -hmm. So for example, in the academic hour opens with a description of a school that inflicts injuries from a car accidents retroactively on the members of the student body. Do you yeah. think that is reflecting your own sort of definitely. reluctance to dance in public again after? Oh, you... definitely. I, I think um, I am assuming, constantly assuming the position of an underdog um, in order, as a survival mode, um, in order to take control of my failures. I've also took up clowning, which is quite hitting it on the nose, uh, which is a, a, a embodying failure for the audience amusement. But I, I, I am a, a perfectionist at heart, and I'm obsessed, and I have social anxiety. Um, and so in order to excuse myself, um, that I bump into things and have terrible sense of navigation, uh, I lean into that and make that become uh, my adventure in life. And I find that, okay, I'm going to get lost. I know that. And it used to hinder me from going outside. So instead of just wandering about, I take a really insane looking prop, like this spoon I brought to this festival. <laughs> and if, if I walk around and I can't find the white flint room, just as me, people won't, you know, I, I'd be wasting time. But this way, if I walk around doing exactly the same thing, uh, I get to meet people and have conversations <laughs> while I get lost because it's like a, a, a thunder rod or the, whatever. The clowning breaks the ice. <laughs> yeah. And so I, uh, I'm really trying to take everything that uh, I, I used to be heavily medicated for my OCD, and now I just use it to make tiny, tiny circles. I, I really try, and I think this is part of becoming adult, is to say, I don't need to fix myself in order to start life. I just need to claim what I am and do it. And, and comics has been a great medium to do so, and um, to see all those dots, they're <laughs> clearly someone off their meds. And uh, I... <laughs> Um, but again, this causes me to uh, share something with people and, and get it back. Um, well, as I told you in email, I thought, you know, I, my first opinion that I had when I looked at that picture is, of course, it's an enormous amount of work, but it also reminded me of textiles. Mm -hmm. So do you think in addition to dance and to your interest in architecture, do you think textiles is another art form that your work intersects with? Uh, yes, um, we actually conversed about this a little bit. Right. It, it, it does, uh, I mean, the, um, subconsciously, my uh, artistic references, being a dancer, a former student of dance, I should say, not a professional one. Um, uh, we, uh, I mean, the dance history is uh, basically started the modern dance history with Ballet Russe and Diaghilev, uh, and this, those sets were created by the Europeans who were inspired <laughs> by Japanese art and Orientalism, like Gauguin and um, Egypt and this flatness and uh, Japanese woodblock. Uh, so if you Google uh, Leon Bax, who was the set main costume designer, you would see a lot of similarities. Uh, not consciously channeling that, but it is how I see art uh, because it was embedded in me and 
I actually danced with these pieces on me. Um, but the texture does help me uh, cons reconcile the flatness of the paper. Uh, it's my new dancing space, and I have to see, find ways of how to make it 3D for me. And I use, uh, I try to translate space into texture, um, and then find uh, how, um, if space is built like brick by brick, what are the bricks of the two-dimensional paper? Um, I just articulated this for the first time. Uh, <laughs> this is not a conscious thought that I have, um, but yeah. Cool. Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, let me transition to Reinhardt and ask uh, questions about how uh, there's a number of panelists, particularly Reinhardt and Leslie, who share the expression of music in, in visual terms in comics. And I wanted to start with Reinhardt and ask uh, if it was if it, the way that you panel in the new book, in the Stardust book, has anything to do with the theme of the book. Because the theme of the book is David Bowie trying to get past his sort of what the life everyone else expects of him, right? This sort of provincial life where he'll settle down, he'll be, you know, lower middle class, you know, the kind of origins that he's expected to come from, from his family. Um, and when you do that, you panel in small panels that are densely populated with words. And then when he sings, it explodes <laughs> into, into double page spreads and, 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 and splash pages and such. Is that a conscious attempt to sort of see him getting free from those expectations that everyone has on him? No, yeah, abs absolutely. Um, I also I used also the color um, for um, determining what's happening in the in the story. Um, actually, I did only half of the colors in the book. I have a colorist, and he did the more interesting uh, color artwork. I did the more boring you color did the, artwork. The, the drab provincial British coloring. <laughs> yeah, I, I did the, the um, how do you say that um, the the memory uh, like the. the right. The, the back, flashback, uh, flashbacks, right. yeah. yeah. Uh, when he was, well, his uh, time when he was living with his family, when he was uh, dreaming about uh, breaking free, and right. uh, and then, well, yeah, the beginning of his career. So there's this more boring color uh, artwork. Then and then, when it gets really, really exciting, then uh, my friend Thomas uh, kicks in, and he did this really crazy colors that I would never <laughs> even dream of using, and I think that makes a very good. Um, um, connection with the story, so it really tells um, how uh, a new world opens up for David Bowie. I can see the contrast with the the panel on the bottom of the first page. To the well, the, um, the well, the the, um, the page on the um, on the on the left side. That's even um, that's also Thomas' work. Mm. My artwork, my color artwork, is even more boring. Than <laughs> <that>. <laughs> Um, one, of the, one of the interesting things that you sent to me when we had an email exchange getting ready for the panel is that in addition to choosing musical uh, performers as you know, often your biographical subjects, you yourself are a musical performer, but you usually do what's called live drawing concerts, right? So here's an example of you with your band, The Good Sons, drawing while they're performing. How does that increase the affinity that you have between music and drawing? Well, it's some, it was something that um, that I discovered in France um, several years ago, and uh, I was very impressed by the performance of uh, Christophe Blanc. He was uh, performing with a band, and the audience was applauding when he made a beautiful line. And um, I was like, oh my God, I want to have that <laughs> moment too, just one time in your life, feeling like a rock star. <laughs> and um, so several years later, um, I got an invitation to go to Lyon to a a comic book festival, and they said, you want to do a live drawing performance with musicians playing Johnny Cash? And I said, okay, let's, let's try it. That works. And since then, I'm constantly working on uh, um, performances like that. You've uh, done, like, set, I mean, you have a list of photographs from your website, and it's got to be at least 20, 25 concerts that you've done that way. Yeah, yeah, a lot of, a lot of concerts yeah. with different bands in different countries right. as well, like Ukraine or Sudan, or last year I was in Iraq. That put me into a lot of trouble when I was Your trying to get to right the to States. <laughs> <laughs> I got refused two times and um, just because of um, this concert in Iraq. And, um, and this is a photo of my band um, playing David Bowie songs in Berlin. And, um, and next year I'm doing an opera 
in, in Germany, uh, which is uh, fantastic for me because I have more time then for each drawing. Because uh, usually in a pop song, it's... That's right, the songs are longer. <laughs> yeah, it's three or four minutes. And in opera, right. well, you have much more time then. Do you prefer to do performances with David Bowie songs? Or do you... Oh, like here's one example that I purloined off your website of you uh, drawing during a performance of the Berlin Philharmonic doing uh, Stravinsky's Firebird. What are yeah. the differences between the kind of music that you perform and how does that affect your line? Well, yeah, actually, well, it's the time. Um, well, for David Bowie songs, you have to be much more faster. For uh, Firebird, uh, I have, um, it's 45 minutes long, but I had seven drawings. And um, so it was, um, to, it was a concert for um, families. And so um, to tell the story of the Firebird to the children, we used um, the illustrations and together with the, with the music, which is very important, expressive and uh, it well it formed the story uh, it's like a fairy tale it's a very beautiful um, piece of music yeah the, we can mm. see that's one of that's your drawings it. and I wanted to ask obviously even when you're working in you know operas that give you more time you don't underdraw at all do you find that liberating as you're drawing or do you find that uh, yeah, yeah, liberating in in a way because uh, for for this in another, yeah, and terrifying yeah <laughs> because for this drawing I had six minutes and so <laughs> within the six minutes you only have to finish the drawing. Yeah, just straight with markers, right? Just right on. The you have these brush pens, um, the well, the pencil brush pens, and I hacked them and so um, right. and um, and th th yeah, it's a lot of fun um, because you you're more expressive, you're more like um, you don't. Uh, actually um, pay attention to details. You just right. want to finish the drawing in the certain and amount of the time. And impulse, the, the, yeah. the overall sort of feeling that you want to impart yeah. through the drawing. And then uh, there was this lady sitting next to me with a with a sheet of notes, and she was uh, pointing me. Okay, now you have only two minutes left, one minute left. Okay, change the paper, <laughs> because it had to be on time with the music, and because the music was uh, also telling the story, so it had to be on the point. Wow. Okay. I didn't realize you had your own choreographer sort of telling you. What the yeah, yeah. And at this point, I worked with the choreographer. <laughs> I have one more question, and, and this is not so much a, a question about representing different media as it is representing a different genre. You've done biographies of musicians and sports figures, and although it is more of a genre than a medium, I'm curious about your process. What kind of materials do you consult when you begin to write a biography? Primary materials, letters, other biographies? And also, what liberties do you take with your protagonists in the book when you're reconstructing situations and you have them you know, delivering dialogue or interacting? Yeah, in the beginning, I try to get everything I can um, about about a person. Well, there's differences in the case of David Bowie. Well, every step of him is documented, and uh, in other cases, I have um, lesser uh, research material. Like for uh, the book about Harry Half, there is only the book of his son. That's uh, there was a source for what happened to Harry Half during the time when he was in the concentration camps, and. Um, so, but in this case, I was also doing a lot of research around that. So, what was the situation there, and, and uh, so a lot of picture material. So, it's mostly biographies, interviews, but also movies. And I try to get a feeling for uh, also how the character talks and how the character acts when, for example, when he enters a room, um, how is well the, the expression of his uh, of his body and uh, and so yeah I try I try to do um, uh, in cases where it has to be historically correct and I, I try to be as correct as possible for example I did also a book about Fidel Castro right. uh, which has to be really correct because well it's about politics was it, was it liberating to do the Nick Cage book then because it was kind of very like a, very a liberating fascinating mix of facts with complete and outright fabrications and lies. <laughs> yeah, I had, yeah, yeah the, the point about the Nick Cave book was that I had contact with uh, Nick Cave himself and he was very into the project and he gave a lot of ideas. And at some point uh, in the very beginning of the process, I told him my first draft about what I had in mind, how to tell the story. And he was like, 
Reinhardt, that's boring. Um, you, you, could, you are doing a comic book. You can shoot me to the moon. And, and you don't have to pay attention to all the details. And then I was thinking about it, and then I said, okay, that's actually, that's exactly what I want. Uh, so I did shoot him into space in the, in the biography. And, and he loved it. He, lo he really liked it. And he's, yeah, he said uh, the book is, a, um, how he quoted it, like a... Um, a collection of uh, lies, lies and, <laughs> and half-truths, right. but it's closer to the truth than any other biography about him. <laughs> and um, so so what I wanted to do with the book is actually tell some details about his life, because that's what the reader expects. But I also wanted to tell something about what he means to me and what he means to be as an as an artist, it's actually the, the book is about the role of the artist and how an artist creates a universe and uh, creates characters um, and if he's a really good artist then the characters they come to life and they can ask their maker so why do I have to die that's right, that's right. is it just for for you to have a good story or what's behind all this so um, so yeah that's I think that's what he liked about it <laughs> because and they are too, so. yeah the, because his man. characters are very mean to him in the end <laughs> Well, I wanted to move on and ask a few questions of Leslie, who also works a lot within, within music, uh, both as a practicing musician yourself and also as someone who, who does stories about musicians. One of the things that we discussed on email was the issue of representing music as colors. So, for example, you gave me a, a link to this uh, Majestic Creatures strip from 2015. That is, the, this is the very beginning of the strip where uh, your protagonist, uh, you know, comes on a song and starts to sort of like express the song to other bandmates and tries to get it right. Um, and one of the things that you said is that you were sort of inspired by um, uh, a couple of different artists, uh, Kadansky and Paul Clay, in terms of the way you use color in order to represent music. Do you want to? I, I, I didn't go to art school, so <laughs> I, I need to be schooled on this myself. Uh, what what what? What what approach are you taking? I, I, if I remember, you're taking more of a clay kind of approach to. Or is that right? Or is well, no, I, no, Kandinsky. That's right. Uh, Kandinsky, yeah. Kandinsky. Um, so, as someone who plays with color, which you can see, I get very excited about. <laughs> um, I'm mostly looking for a feeling. And uh, two people, two artists that I really go back to a lot is uh, Paul Clay and Kandinsky, who were. Uh, friends and who also thought about their paintings uh, in musical terms, but both in very different ways. Where Clay was a classically trained, um, I, I can't remember actually what uh, instruments he played, but he set up some of his paintings almost to look like scores, and there would be tiny little things going on that were uh, opposed to each other, and they were very mathematically put together. Whereas the polar opposite, uh, Kandinsky, was really th having a spiritual experience thinking about what does this mean to me? What is the color that I'm feeling? Kind of like synesthetic right. ideal. So what I did with this comic, which is up here, was you could see the first panel, she's writing the second panel, there's some color, there's other color coming in, and every time there's another instrument or idea represents another color, which is very similar to the way you make a painting. Right. Um, so everything's playing off of uh, each other in a band. Even if you're doing something like on a four track by yourself, if you're laying down a guitar, you lay down a drum track, it's these things weaving around each other, and it's the same way that I think about painting. Um, but also just the joy of creating, I hope, comes across in yes, it. Yes, very much so. Um, and then at the end, you can see it's like very cacophonous. And because I don't, uh, I use watercolor and I don't use the computer, you know, I, I can't go back into it. So it really is me being there and being, being in the spontaneous moment. spontaneous and putting the marks down. Not in like the way Reinhardt does when he's got to keep up with the score. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So. Okay. Okay. Um, you also, in, 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 in another story, uh, this is from uh, uh, Perfect Day, uh, which also includes an explicit clay reference. You, you get it really, you know, your protagonist gets really, I, there's an exhibit of clay that I want to go see. 
Um, you and a friend go to hear the music of Tom Harrell, a schizophrenic trumpet player whose music moves the protagonist to tears. Um, what specifically about the colors and lines of this page capture this epiphany? And are there certain lines and colors? It's, it's, it's paler, for example, than the earlier example. Uh, is there something there that's designed to sort of capture Harold's schizophrenia? Or I don't think it was thought out. I think I was feeling in the same way that I say like Kandinsky would feel where right. it's, it's just an emotion. And I think that Tom Harrell is not a very well-known jazz player, but because he suffers from schizophrenia, you see him shaking on stage and he has all these issues. But when right. he actually you can plays, kind of see him very say he, hello, and that's yeah. all he says before he starts to play. And he's in black and white there, right. and then all of a sudden he's in color, and then that's where I think his soul is coming out. Mm -hmm. So it's just a reaction, you know. It's like I'm just laying this down, right. and I work really. You can see I work really fast, and it's about the emotion. It's about, you know. I always I gesture. always have this temptation when I read your work to sort of ascribe it to you. Did this <laughs> happen to you? Did this? Yeah, this is okay. from. Uh, this is autobiography. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Okay. Now, in your most recent book, which is uh, Brooklyn's Last Secret, there's a shift when uh, minor or major threat, I should say, not minor, threat, <laughs> yeah. uh, plays at a fish after party, which is kind of inappropriate for the music that they play. Yes. Lights and colors actually annoy the band, right? They're supposed to play at this party, and then they're getting blasted with these sort of like weird lattices of light that. Is, is completely different from all the other gigs that they had on this tour. Um, in this case, it's not so much a feeling or an epiphany as it is a nuisance. Uh, is that because it, the characters themselves perceive it rather than the reader who's supposed to read it as synesthetic marks, or is it something else? Or is it just something that fits the plot? I think point? mostly it just fits the plot. Right. And that, you know, as you're working, this was a 300-page graphic novel, and this was kind of the end of the novel, and I, I wanted a reward for working on that <laughs> novel. <laughs> so you get to paint something pretty. I'm like, pretty. okay, here we go. Fish <laughs> after party? It's going to be whatever I want it to be. But right. it's also like this book is fiction, but it's based on touring and my experience touring, and I have played a fish after party, <laughs> and With there light? was a light show. Oh, okay. <laughs> and I, I loved it. Some of my bandmates did not like it. Um, but drawing that was so fun for me. So that was kind of my little reward and a reward to the reader for making it that far. And also right. part of the plot line, just that, uh, you know, you have a, a post-hardcore band that's now right. in a fish after party <laughs> setting. So right. it's, I, it's for I, humor. <laughs> I laughed out loud in the scene right before they start to play where it's kind of like they're like, well, it looks like you're trapped in here with us because there's like three or four people standing in the audience and that's it. You know? Yeah, but at the end, one of the players goes, no, we're trapped in here with them. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies um, to the fish fans. That's right. <laughs> um, this sort of leads me into my last question uh, for you and then we'll, we'll, we'll do Andrew and then we'll open it up to questions and, and, and everything else, which is, um, this is another uh, genre question rather than a medium question, but it seems to me that even when you tell a story about serious topics, like for example, I know you writer, which, which ends with the words, I'm happy, repeating I'm happy from earlier in the story, your fundamental way of looking at the world is, as I write here, playful, comic, and optimistic. Uh, Brooklyn's Last Secret is a great ensemble comedy. Where does your comic disposition come from, and do you think it makes you an outlier among other indie cartoonists? <laughs> you know, I haven't been asked that question in a long time. Oh, okay. But when I first started, you know, and I think that autobiographical comics, you know, when I came into this like 20 years ago, where right. it was very much like a very sad sack, like... You know, and everyone's like, are you the antidote to... Oh, really? And I was like, no, I just, like, it's my... It's my emotions. And also, I mean, one of the main things for me is, like, if I'm sitting at my room, you know, and have this tiny thing in front of me for a year, right. I want to be happy with it. You know, I don't want to dig into, like, the, and even if things are difficult, I still want to see, like, the sunshine in it yeah. and color in it and give people a reward for looking at it, even if it's a difficult situation. So... It, it's not thought out in that way, but I think it's just, it's a reward to myself and the reader, right. you know? Yeah, I mean. To it, approach it, it that way. It's, I mean, a lot of autobiographical cartoonists are cartoonists dealing with difficulties in their lives and they're, uh, they're tough to read. Yeah, but absolutely. But they're also, I mean, I think that's a gift to other people. You know, it's like the whole point of art is 
you're not alone. You know, it's not just to entertain, but it's like, you know, just showing someone like you're not alone, it makes the whole thing worthwhile for the reader as well as yourself. Thank you. All right. I wanted to transition to Andrew now and, and talk about some of the, the, the uh, mediums that you, or media, I should say, that uh, your work interacts with. And we can start with literature. So for example, one of the things that you pointed out to me was that um, in the passage from uh, Together and Apart, you uh, talk about um, uh, time passes and you borrow words from uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, that passage from, uh, I think it's To the Lighthouse, right? Did I, did I introduce you or did I skip you by mistake? No, you introduced me. Oh, I did. Okay. Sorry. I'm very nervous up here, so I'm a little paranoid that I didn't do a proper You're job. You're doing great. Thanks, thanks. <laughs> but you would say that. You're the optimist. <laughs> but uh, um, so why do you evoke Wolf here specifically in this passage? That is, uh, does your citation of literature pay tribute to modernist writers by appropriating their words and putting them in different contexts the way that modernists do? Or Yeah. So, I mean, what's going on here is, you know, it's, it's a portion of the book that's a right. biography of Virginia Woolf and is adapted specifically from her diary. One thing that I decided right. earlier on, we were talking about source material. Um, all of the words in this book are, are from primary sources, are from letters or right. diaries or other material written either by the subject herself or by someone close to her right. um, who, who also appears in the work. Um, so yeah, a, a number of the words here are either from Virginia Woolf's diary or um, there's a few references to, to the lighthouse. And yeah, it just seems sort of natural to me um, to make a sort of more explicit nod to her writing, which she's talking about. I mean, that's sort of one of the ways I fell into doing something on Woolf is because you know I'd recommend to anyone reading her diaries uh, just as a way to think through what it means to construct your life as someone making art and how being successful as an artist or being, feeling fulfilled as an artist does and doesn't interact with being fulfilled and happy as a person. I think Wolf thought really carefully about that. Um, and so it just seemed natural to me to incorporate an explicit reference to her work uh, in this material. And yet for anyone who hasn't read To the Lighthouse, there's a middle section called Time Passes and when I needed sort of like a time jump in terms of the chronology of my wolf material, it made sense to, to title that section Time Passes and to make some nods to, to the lighthouse in terms of both uh, the words and the visuals. Okay. I did want to ask you about something that you just mentioned, which is that you do bring in words from other novels. Uh, uh, when we were exchanging again emails, I, I confess that I had not read William Gaddis's The Recognition, so I didn't get the reference to that on some of the pages in the Stein material. Um, but why bring in other authors rather than the primary materials of the creators that you're talking about? Yeah, it's it's an interesting thing, and you know I think I can only answer sort of in terms of individual choices. So I'll talk about this one to make an allusion to the recognitions, which which came about because so in working on the Stein material, if anyone's read Gertrude Stein's writing, you'll know you know it's pretty difficult to read. It's pretty unique in terms of its cadence and its rhythm. Um, and so it sort of occurred to me that would be interesting and, and not too difficult in terms of imita imitating that style to write as Gertrude Stein from beyond the grave, sort of looking back on her life. Um, and so that's a departure. You know, we, we, you asked a question again earlier about sort of historical accuracy. Right. Um, and you know, this was the first time in the course of making this work that I sort of explicitly chose to do something that, that wasn't true, that couldn't be true. Um, and so that led me to think more about lying in general. Uh, the book also talks about Picasso's portrait of Gertrude Stein yes. quite a bit. Um, a portrait can be a lie, right? A portrait tries to ca capture someone at a moment in time. Uh, it might or might not do so accurately. It might or might not make sort of explicit choices about how to depict that person. And I'm making those choices as well in the course of making this work. So sort of when it, once I took the one step to sort of consider what lying meant in the context of my narrative and the context of portraiture, it seemed really natural to make an allusion to the recognitions, which for anyone who hasn't read it, is a work uh, in which art forgery and portraiture play really important roles. Um, and yeah, just thinking about that work sort of 
gave me some answers in terms of how to conclude the, the Stein section of, of my comic as well. Right. I, I wanted to ask you a question specifically about the, the Picasso Stein portrait because what's interesting about that is that you draw it in all kinds of different ways. So in addition to appropriating the words of the various creators that you're looking at in the book, you also appropriate images of them. At one point, I think the, the Picasso portrait appears with no head. Um, and, and so, you know, this kind of freewheeling, not freewheeling, that's, that, that doesn't really respect the sort of poetic tone of what you adopt in your book, but it's, you know, it's this kind of, you know, willingness to sort of take that material and play with it the same way that the modernists did. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, I think for me that's driven by a really important mechanism in terms of how I make work is just like generating material. I can draw pretty quickly. My style, as, as folks will see from the images that are here, is pretty... Uh, spare, pretty sparse. And so that was actually the first thing that I did when I realized I was going to be making work about Stein and about the Picasso portrait specifically, right. is I drew it dozens and dozens of times. You know, it became sort of a meditative process. And, you know, of course, the first couple or the first dozen uh, versions were, were more or less copies, at least as best as I could manage them. And then I sort of went further and further afield pretty quickly. Um, so yeah, it, you know, and then it sort of, I suppose, seemed natural to sort of uh, collage those copies and place them in different points in the work in a way that, that perhaps made some sort of rhythmic sense. Right. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's sort yeah, of Yeah, it's definitely a recurrent motif. Uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. We can look at maybe a couple of other appropriations that you did of, of, of images. Uh, here's, for example, where you kind of emulate Stiglitz's hands of George O'Keefe photographs in the in the book itself. Uh, why the hands at that moment in the book when when you're doing that kind of? Yeah, know? well, it's it's so as is perhaps obvious to everyone. You know, George O'Keefe is the only visual artist um, that I touched on right. among the three subjects in this work, and and people might know that her yeah her husband Alfred Stieglitz, whose whose work is pictured here, uh, was a photographer. And so it just seemed natural, again, in terms of, you know, we were talking about this in the context of uh, Picasso's portrait, and, and here it seemed even more natural to just pull in as much as I could from their own work and sort of, you know, I'm, I'm always much more comfortable, I mentioned earlier, generating images. I'm much more comfortable as an editor of my own work. Um, and here just sort of editing and sequencing and combining or removing images from the people that I wanted to talk about you know, made more sense. I think, I think, or I hope that placing these images in sequence and adding just a few words says much, much more about these two people and the relationship between them and the relationship between themselves and their art, you know, than I possibly could by writing paragraphs and paragraphs and capturing of that sort of early epistolary relationship that they had That's with right. the phrase heat and excitement. Yeah. yeah. And, and also, in addition to photography and, and emulation of literature, you have painting and drawing. We already mentioned the Picasso portrait, but also O'Keeffe's drawings of tree branches. So is there a difference when you're appropriating imagery uh, of appropriating something that's a painting as opposed to a drawing? Or? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to be sort of uh, an accurate copyist here. We touched on this a little bit earlier. But you know, I'd, I'd, I'd like to hope that anyone who's familiar with either of these pieces of work would, would recognize them in reading the comic. Um, but yeah, making a copy isn't a goal um, in the sense that I'm just trying to gesture towards the rhythm and the emotion of the person's life. And I think sort of, you know, looking at their images and translating them in a way that is sort of natural to me in terms of how I make marks is going to be much more successful than sort of, yeah, again, rigidly trying to, to copy the original and, and come up with a copy that's that's excessively accurate. And it's more modernist, right? You're yeah. appropriating it into the, your own work. Very rather, true. Right. Um, what I wanted to do is switch over to ask if the audience has any questions. But before we do that, I know that because you all are sort of doing different approaches to different media, I sort of, you know, went one, two, three, four, rather than asking intermingling questions. So do any of the panelists have questions for any of the other panelists? Proceed oh. on. Not meaning to put you on the spot, mind you, but <laughs> anything? Uh, yes, no, maybe? Feels like too many for <laughs> Yeah, it's a lot of, it's a lot of ideas <laughs> flying around. It yeah, really is. I think mostly not questions, but just um ins inspired to 
first of all, just jump into the books, but also um, I think this is something that's true to the subject of this panel, um, um, borrowing from a conference that I really enjoyed in Oxford University, like prismatic translation um, that um, when you were um, um, uh, interested in other media, um, sometimes you have to be kind of like a, a really love and passion for it. Sometimes um, you need that space outside of it. Like that's not quite um, to be, uh, it puts you in a place of astoundment and fascination. And when you start to study it, you're really quickly going, um, when you become a professional in the media which you're interested in, you have to forge your own path and you very quickly become yourself in that medium. And you don't get to view it as a, like an, an adventurer. Yeah, right. And then there's, uh, and then what I am inspired by or haven't thought about until this conversation uh, is that um, this is uh, comics as a for hybrid form itself that allows you to spend space in the connections between things rather than in the things itself is the perfect place to explore another medium, but not learn, like, not become a practitioner in it, but to become to and to share your love of or, it, or or to so. stretch yourself to the point yeah. where you're taking chances, like drawing spontaneously at a show yeah. or whatever. You know, I mean, just kind of like doing it without a net. You know. Yeah, um, and then there's that side uh, for like uh, Leslie being a, a professional in the medium depicted, but also. Um, not just that, but also um, bringing into the work of the artist she, uh, she admires. Uh, yeah, it's right. really interesting for me. Or being inspired at the very least by the words of Kidnam. Oh, Kinesky yeah, to, yeah. To, to, to sort of like just emotionally feel it and put it down on the page yeah. in watercolor, no less, which is <laughs> permanent. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I always go back to you, and what I see on this panel is like, I don't know. There were certain things that I got when I was in art school that was really just learning like sentences that resonated with me. And one of the ones that resonated with me and that it can take a lot of different, you can take a lot of different paths with it. It's like draw what you love. And I see that across the panel. It's like draw what you love. Yeah. And when you love something, you're going to give 100% to it because you don't want to uh, devalue it. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, I see that here, and it's it's wonderful. You know? That's cool. You're th unified by love. <laughs> Perhaps I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Reinhardt's like, wait a second. Yeah. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> ah. But I, I would never draw something that I hate, or right. um, when I would draw something that I draw. Can I, with can I lot ask of a slightly hate. loaded question about that that popped into my head? Uh, about boxing? No, no, about mm. uh, David Bowie. The next one is about the Berlin years, but there's going to be a scene yeah. that you have to draw that's let, going to be well, painful. Let me add something about boxing. Oh, and, okay, sure. And <laughs> before I started working on these two books about uh, boxers, I, I really right. hated boxing. And um, I, it was not this kind of sport that I would be interested in. But then during the research, I went to some uh, box fights and I sat in the audience with my sketchbook. And uh, after two or three fights, I was really into that sport. And uh, mm -hmm. now, <laughs> I'm, I wouldn't say I'm a huge fan of boxing, but uh, I, I like it and uh, because I was, I was learning more about it and I was looking behind the brutality of the sport and, and saw what kind of beauty it can have. So, um, so unified by like or love. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> But do you know what I mean with the Bowie doc? Because at the end of the book, you're going to go through, you're going to do several books on Bowie's career. No, just like. two. Just two? Okay. Yeah. yeah I, 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 at the end of the, of the Stardust, it, it's a, or it says, uh, it says, uh, yeah, yeah, there's, Berlin there's, years, yeah, there's going to be a second volume. It's about right. the Berlin years because Berlin is my hometown and mm -hmm. uh, he lived there for right. two years, more or less. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm, I'm working right, right now on the, inking of the pages right. and um, and uh, oh, we have 10 minutes I see yeah. and uh, so yeah it's, it's it's a lot of fun because I can draw right. scenes from my from my city. I'm just thinking about the, the salute when he came into Berlin. Yeah yeah, yeah that's Berlin used to be a very picture. different city back then in right. the in the 70s so um, I'm kind of dreaming myself into the situation. Right right. 
Okay. Well, it looks like we have about 10 minutes left in the panel, so let's open it up for questions. There are mics, microphones on both sides, so if you wouldn't mind walking up and using the microphones, that would be terrific. Thank you, folks. <clears throat> so, and uh, we'll start over here on the left, since I think you're going to get the mic first, so yeah. go ahead. <laughs> okay. Hi. Um, so I'm trying to make a comic about a musician, but I'm not a musician myself, and it's something that I really want to incorporate into the story because it's something that ends up being like a freeing thing for him that he's kind of fighting against. And so I guess like since there's two of you are musicians, I'm just curious to know like how you could recommend like someone who's an outsider kind of getting into the world of that and maybe depicting it. I'm I'm not a musician. Um, <laughs> well, no. I, but you do have a band. <laughs> yeah, but I'm drawing in the band. Uh, the others are making the music. That counts. Um, I also, I mean, I draw to music. And if you can imagine, this is what I would do. If you can imagine, is this a character that's um, fictional? Yeah. This okay. Is fiction, yeah. Can you imagine what his music sounds like? Are there bands that like you would put on a playlist like this is these are the bands that this guy listens to yeah i so, actually made like a a huge playlist in december of like all the music you would probably listen to mm -hmm. stuff that inspires me too for the story and i realized like this is a big inspiration for me too mm -hmm. but i just have never played so i don't think you need to i think that that music well, it's already the inspiration for you coming up with this character. And if you confuse like your feeling with that, I don't think you need to know. You know, it's not like I drew like a the musician's book where they're tuning. Well, there is a panel where they're tuning, but it's they're talking while they're tuning. Right. It's not going like neat e, you know, and so I think you have to keep in mind when people are reading it, as long as they're having the feeling of like the infusion of like that music and the feeling of it and the way people talk to each other and how you imagine the character, like, I think you're already, you're already on the right path, you know? One of the things I love about the Brooklyn book is that w we only hear them sing and play one line of the song, <laughs> one line of one song. It's just, they open the gig and then you cut to like the gig being over. Or right, and, so the, it's and the, an ongoing joke the line is you gotta fight for your life. Right. And life is spelled with a Y. -F -F -E so, something. you know, <laughs> I think, yeah, I mean, that's all. I, that's all I have to say about that. It's a good joke. Yeah. <laughs> it's you know you're waiting for the music and then you flip yeah. right past it. Yeah. Yes. So two of you. That was way too close to the mic. So two of you used um, the word choreography and then you used um, I'm not going to remember, but like a framework of feeling music um, in your um, while talking about your comics. I'm just wondering, how does like the vocabulary or the framework of your background kind of influence uh, how, what you bring to the page or how you think about creating the art? Um, I, I have an answer, so I'll just shoot. Because um, <laughs> um, uh, I think about this a lot. Um, I think it's, it stems from... Um, uh, uh, trying to hold on to as many pieces and memories of me dancing, I really miss it. It's the one thing in my life I really miss. And uh, knock on wood, I haven't lost... No, I have, actually. I, I, I have lost people. But, <laughs> but this is a loss that I feel, and I, I, it's kind of I'm in mourning for it. Uh, so I return to these memories a lot, and I keep on hearing my dancers, uh, my teachers voices in my head and I return to the clips that we saw um, and I try to understand what I didn't then at age 15 or 14. Um, and um, I use uh, all these vocabularies uh, and I draw, t like uh, I watch clips online, I watch performances, I go to um, uh, the same performances again and again live and I draw them. Um, and it becomes a book as a result of the accumulation of pages of just me doing this. Um, and then, uh, in order to make it like a professional thing that I do, because I would uh, t to teach my students or to ex exhibit this work, um, 
I had to also take it a step further, which I did this year, um, is place, uh, try to figure out uh, how to describe this process of choreography on paper, um, and then uh, assemble the book, which is linear, it has a page sequence. Um, the way I do it is I draw, like for two years, I accumulate drawings, and I have no idea what the story is. They're just figures dancing. Um, they may stem from various events that I'm feeling at the time and dancing, but they don't tie in with each other. And then I place them on a wall and I create a composition as if I'm really composing. I, I put images together that have the best movement or have the most, sorry. And then I look at it and then I dance it. And sometimes I dance it outside in public, the way I walk with a spoon. <laughs> and then I, I see what happens. Most probably like conversations happen, or or I get invited to weird stuff, <laughs> and uh, and then that becomes the story that I write one week before I send it to my publisher. Um, but it is a very 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 closely knit conversation with the the vocabulary of choreography. If I can intercept here for a second, I wanted to ask a question of Andrew because. It seems to me that you know there's a little divide in the panel between folks who are more traditional in terms of the storytelling that they do, and folks who sort of experiment and not exactly mistrust, but definitely play with, you know, the trajectory of the stories that you're telling. Do you, a Andrew? I'm, I, it seems to me like, you know, you're telling a story about somebody's life or sections of people's lives. You're definitely choosing which sections to sort of focus on and. Often the images don't even show the person, but rather some natural phenomenon or something like that. Does that come from a sort of modernist mistrust of story, or? Maybe, I don't, I don't know that I'd call it modernist, but yeah, I certainly do find myself at times skeptical or mistrustful of some of the confines of traditional storytelling. I mean, I think for mm -hmm. me, and I think all of us have moments in our work that's at this point, which for me in some ways is the ideal where you're like at the exact midpoint between narrative and non-narrative work. And I think that's something that really lends itself perfectly to comics. And I really relate quite a bit to what Karen was saying in terms of like, just again, just generating images and, and creating sequences by placing those images in various orders. And yeah, it's, it's magical to me the way that, you know, a single image that's completely abstract or non-narrative on its own can, I think, uniquely in comics, or perhaps especially well in comics, you know, have a huge amount of emotional resonance and narrative weight because of the context in which it appears. So yeah, it's mm -hmm. interesting. I didn't know, Karen, that you worked the way you do. And, and yeah, it's funny that I, having no background in dance or choreography, sort of <laughs> choreograph my pages and my images in a pretty similar way. Sort of move sections around yeah, the same way. Yeah, exactly. Right, right, right. Yeah. I think we have time for just one more question. We just have a couple minutes left in the panel. Does anyone have any final questions? All right, uh, if you all want to just mention again one more time where you'll be at so folks can go up and get your work after the panel ends. I do, but I also would just want to oh, say. Please, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, no, no, it's okay. I just because I think um, I learned a lot from this person. I used to be Richard McGuire's assistant oh. while he was working on here for a year, and Richard is a musician, and the way uh, here was set up for a year was all the pages were on the wall, and it was composing right. the moments. And yeah. it's available, the sketches are available as a PDF online called Five Dial with here. Um, if it, I mean, it's exactly what you described and yeah. yeah I, don't know, I don't know how many folks were at the uh, movie last night about Justin Green and Carol Tyler, but there are images of both of them hanging their pages oh, on a yeah. clothesline, you know, and being able to move it around, and move around sequences and such, so yeah. Sorry, uh, B3. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm at M12, and right next door at M13 is Fieldmouse Press, the publisher of the new book. Uh, K something, um, <laughs> self-made hero, it's self my publishing hero. house. Right. And yeah, I'll be at uh, W86 in the morning. Let's thank our panelists. <laughs>